Today, I'm going to talk about how determinism doesn't exclude God, it excludes human beings. Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. So this is motivated, um, I mean, I've seen this in a bunch of places, but it's motivated uh, at the moment by a comment that I got on my video about uh, how the other sciences aren't based in physics. So I'm going to read the comment and then jump into it. So uh, now um, the, the, it starts with a quote uh, that he's responding to, but the quote is not actually from someone, it's a summary, but so he's sort of summarizing quote. Uh, I don't like reductionism. It doesn't leave room for magic, close quote. The point of everything is downstream of physics isn't, uh, I'm sorry, is there's no secret level where magic sneaks in. Obviously accounting for quantum and high level calculations like ballistics is too cumbersome, but if you could, the math checks out. There is no magic, no pixies. There's, there's no gap here to stuff a god in. Okay. So, um, first off, I mean, it's, it's kind of funny because like, this is literally like, you can't do the math, but if you could, it checks out is um, literally a statement of faith. So it's kind of funny to be presented with this statement of faith in such a, a you know, bold way. Um, it's also kind of amusing because um, interestingly enough, uh, you know, kind of famously, um, general relativity and quantum mechanics don't agree with each other. They contradict each other. That's why they're like all these fields like quantum gravity and string theory and so on within theoretical physics attempting to come up with the unified theory. The whole reason they're trying to do this is because these, you know, th these two are very, very successful, but they contradict each other. So they can't actually both be true in the form that we have them. So uh, it's not actually true that the math would check out. We know that it, it won't check out because they contradict each other. They can't both be true. Um, so yeah, like, like, it's just kind of funny that this is like, it's a statement of faith. It's a statement of faith that we know in fact to be false. So um, I find that amusing, but that's kind of nerd humor, you know, I, um, technical details. Let's take a step back from that though, to, to the broader point, um, to the thing he was saying about like, there's nowhere for the, for the magic to sneak in. Now, of course, magic is a completely, it, the, the person involved couldn't define magic. And, um, none of the, the atheists who like to use the word magic as some kind of slur ever can. Um, in point of fact, like electromagnetism is magic by any kind of definition that they would actually use other than like not in a physics textbook. Um, the, uh, but I mean, there are lots of things that, that are not in a physics textbook, like, uh, you know, for example, butterflies, um, you don't find butterflies in a physics textbook and, uh, they're obviously real. Now, um, I know, I know the, the way they would, um, uh, try to save this is saying like, yeah, but you can derive butterflies from the physics textbook, which is like purely a statement of faith. The, the, the one we were referring to earlier to some degree and what the other video is about. But the point is they, they don't, when they say magic, what they really mean is, I mean, what they really mean is something they don't believe in. Um, but that's useless. I, you know, like, like using the word magic to mean something I don't believe in is, is pointless. And so they would never defend that. Um, but they, you know, like the closest thing that they might defend if they, they were clever enough to understand it would be something along the lines of, um, magic is something that, uh, doesn't operate according to rules I can understand. Um, like, like to some degree they, they want some sort of like mechanistic something or other. Um, but the part that this video is about, the part that I, I really want to focus on now that I've cleared that other stuff out of the way is that part where he says there, there's no gap, um, for a God to fit in. And the, the I, I've made videos about the idiocy of the God of the gaps and so on. And that's entirely not the point. Um, you know, if you, you look at the, the you know, I'll just use a Christian conception of God. It's the, you know, you, you see this, I mean, this is also like, you know, the not, you know, you see this well outside of Christianity. I mean, it's, you see it in Judaism, um, some forms of Islam, you see this in philosophical theism as like, for example, Aristotle, um, and so on. But, uh, you know, who, who certainly was not Christian uh, or Jewish. And um, it is that God is the ground of all contingent being. So all of these laws of physics are, you know, are created by God, just as time and space are created by God and created, um, you know, it's not like a, an initiated and then it's going sense. Like these have their being in God. God is here and now creating every moment. Like the, um, the argument from motion, which is, be better called the argument from change. 
um, motion used to mean change, and then local motion, the change in location, uh, somehow the local got dropped and motion came to mean only the change in location. Um, but it, the, the word originally meant change, and that's why it's called the argument from motion, but it's really the argument from change, is all about how does one moment turn into the next, and God is the ground of how one moment is able to turn into the next moment. Um, so, uh, you know, and others. So, like, the, the point is, you could have a, a physically determinate universe, you know, an absolutely mechanistic universe where everything could be worked out by pencil and paper, um, and everything goes according to that, and it would still have to be created by God because it's still contingent. One moment turns into another moment. Um, you don't, you know, none of these things exist necessarily and in, in themselves and in, in full actuality. So they would, a deterministic universe would have to be contingent on God exactly to the same degree that ours does. This does not, the idea of determinism in no way rules out God, the creator of all that is contingent, of all contingent being, God, the ground of all being, God, the source of time and space and so on. Um, you know, and, and the, the laws of physics, etc. None of that is in any way challenged, not even the slightest little bit, by trying to claim that the world is deterministic. Not even a little bit. Uh, that's why, by the way, for example, Martin Luther was a determinist. He, he wrote an entire book called On the Bondage of the Will, where he said that free will is complete nonsense. Um, it, it is quite possible to be a determinist and to hold that, that you know, God creates the world. I mean, if you're going to be logically consistent, you have to be. Um, you have to hold that if you're a determinist. Um, just you have to hold that if you're not a determinist. What you don't have to hold exists, however, are human beings. In, like, a, more than some stupid, trivial sense. Like, yeah, there are, like, anthropoid things. Okay, fine. Who cares? No one actually cares. Like, oh, I know what human beings are. They, they look like this. Shut up, you moron. Um, th like, this sort of thing... Uh, by the way, I, I don't mean that as, as to the viewer. I'm, this is a hypothetical interaction, not you know, um, to you who are watching at present. The, um, the point is that... It is precisely our experience of free will. It is precisely our experience of the intellect capable of knowing truth, which is, is a concept that you can't separate because the intellect able to know truth is able to interact with truth and respond to it based on truth, not come to predetermined conclusions irrespective of the truth because that, that's the nature of, of being determined. Um, that, that there is... So, so there, there's a strong and weak form of this, and I'll outline both of them. First, the weak form of this, which you see a whole bunch, because um, uh, it's, it's, it's easier to explain, it's sort of more intuitive in, in a certain way, that if the thoughts in the mind are purely the result of the, um, uh, of the bouncing around of atoms, you have absolutely no reason whatsoever to suppose that the thoughts in the mind in any way reflect the nature of reality as it exists outside of the mind. These are purely... That, you know, results in the same way that, like, if you, if you, um, you know, if you break a, uh, on a pool table, you know, you break it and it comes out and it spells out a message. Well, that doesn't actually mean anything. The pool balls, the pool table, they're not trying to communicate to you. You, you know how this happens. You know that if you broke, you know, if they were set up in exactly the same way on exactly the same pool table with the same gravitational fields, um, etc. I mean, and it would be very hard to do that last part because like, you know, um, I, I don't know the exact degree to which this will happen. You know, the influence of the, the various planets and their gravitational fields, um, providing differential forces on something, you know, this small, but at the same time, the differences in angles involved, um, can be so incredibly minute in order to replicate this. It's entirely possible that you even have to take into account the gravitational fields produced by, like, all the people around the room, as well as, like, larger bodies in various places and so on. And, um, I mean, to get a precise answer, you would have to in any event. And, uh, so replicating this is going to be more than a little bit difficult. But, uh, leaving aside the important technical details of you can't really replicate this, but hypothetically, if you could replicate this, um, you would, you know, get the same message spelled out every time. And if you could isolate this system from some other system that this happened to spell out a message about, there is absolutely no reason why this message would have anything to do with that other system. You know, um, you know, if obviously like you, you couldn't spell out these letters in quite this way, but like, you know, if it said like beta Antares, um, went supernova, um, well, 
Maybe it did and maybe it didn't, but you have absolutely no reason to believe that there's any relationship whatsoever between this because the reason why these things were laid out, it, you'd need some sort of specialized code, right? Um, but you could do it with sufficiently specialized codes. Um, that, uh, you know, where each position measured on, you know, millimeters, etc., referred to different words, kind of like how they uh, do in large language models and in their race. Anyway, um, if you really, really care, ask me in the comments and I'll explain the full nerdy way you could actually accomplish this. Anyway, the, um, the point being is that you could accomplish it, you could have a message like this, and you have zero reason to believe that this would have anything to do with the actual star unbelievably far away, because you know why this came to be, and it has no reference whatsoever to that thing that it is describing. That's the basic thing in the weak form of the problem with determinism, that uh, if your mind is physically determined, there is no reason whatsoever to believe that all of these processes that you think have to do with things like truth and rationality and logic actually have anything to do with them whatsoever. Um, and you will see this uh, actually play out among determinists who often like to say that like thoughts uh, and so on are the product of your instincts, which is entirely the wrong level to be determinist on. This is a it is a slightly relevant tangent, so I'm only going to go into it very slightly. But um, what's really curious is that determinists are almost always determinists at the wrong level. They're supposed to be determinists at the level of quantum mechanics, not at the level of instincts. Instincts are themselves part of the epiphenomena, um, epi on top phenomena, um, uh, you know, the thing on top of the phenomena, sort of like, like the uh, tip of the iceberg poking out of the water. Like, it's not what's actually going on, it's just the manifestation you get to see of it. That's what an epiphenomena is. So, uh, the, the instincts are themselves just the epiphenomena of, you know, the, this low-level quantum mechanics and uh, going on. And so, there, they, they, there's no reason to suppose that the instincts actually, like, guide your actions in some way. These instincts are all just epiphenomena, too. So, you could... You know, there's no reason to suppose you can't have an instinct and go do something entirely different. I mean, and in point of fact, human beings do that all the time. Like, I'm hungry, but I don't go eat. Um, anyway, but they will say, um, leaving aside the way that this is incoherent and they're, like, wrong by their own theories, um, they will still often say things like, you know, you just have, like, like what you do is this war of your instincts, and then afterwards you rationalize uh, why you did the thing that you did, even though it was just like the outcome of, a, of an impulse. So they, they do actually kind of like to say this, although they never believe it about their theories that lead to concluding that this is what's going on. Um, you know, they, they never apply this consistently, because if they did, they would stop being able to say that this is what's going on. And uh, C.S. Lewis liked to point this one out. Um, you know, the... Uh, and, and so, like, this is kind of popular to point this one out. Um... Because, like, you can put it a lot more simply than I just did. C.S. Lewis certainly did. Um, indirectly. I, I'm, I like to elaborate, um, because, like, you can see it put simply in a whole bunch of places. Um, but if you, if you really want the simple version, um, essentially, it, it's just that, like, if your mind is determined by, thi you know, by, by sheer physical actions, you have no more reason to suppose that your thoughts are related to truth than you have to suppose that, like, a cabbage is writing a botany textbook in the shape of its leaves. The, um, so that's the weak version. The stronger version of it is that will and intellect are actually uh, necessarily part of the same substance. The ability to grasp truth entails necessarily the ability for the will to direct the intellect at that truth. Um, because the problem is, like, you can't have a, an, a free-floating intellect that is sort of considering everything in a, in a purely passive sort of way, because there would be no content to the intellect. The, in, you know, the very nature of an intellect, at least as what we think of as an intellect, I'm not saying there can't be something else which is, you know, by analogy, an intellect. I'm not here describing the intellect of the angels, for example, although they have will as well. Um, but I'm not, I'm not... Uh, when I talk about will and intellect being inseparably bound, I mean of the sort that we have. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that there there are no possible worlds or possible types of beings very unlike us that have some kind of different intellect that is purely appreciative without any kind of will. Um, but of the sort that we have, like the ability to turn your attention to the truth requires the will. The ability to think about something requires will because you're, you're choosing to think about one thing and not to think about another. And 
uh, you can see the same thing, um, by the way, uh, there, there's a really interesting uh, video in which, um, with uh, Jonathan Pajot and Jordan Peterson, where they're talking about the problem of perception and how the problem um, with perception, that, like uh, uh, people are trying to do generalized AI run into this problem, that, um, the, uh, that they originally thought that the problem was uh, figuring out how to have generalized commands, but the problem is actually how to perceive the world, because when you try to perceive the world, there is an unlimited amount of, in there, there's an effectively unlimited amount of information compared to what you can process. And you have to choose what to pay attention to. And the, the very act of choosing what to pay attention to is an exercise of the will which presuppose, intrinsically presupposes a value hierarchy. To pay attention to one thing but not another is to make a choice and to hold that it is better. And the... Um, um, if you're not completely insane, that that is to say, um, so so you can bounce around from one thing to another with with no purpose, but you know you need to be put into a padded box at that point. The um, so with regard to um, to choosing that, the same thing actually applies to the nature of our categorization of the world. That if you actually look at the categoriza categorization of the world that we do, it is all based upon that same value hierarchy that guides our actions and. It is in general entirely related to, um, if, if you actually look at them, like how do we interact with things? Uh, so for example, like, like when you look at a coffee mug on a table, why do you consider these to be two separate objects? Because you can pick the coffee mug up with like, you know, reasonable amounts of force in, in a way that doesn't break anything. And by break things meaning in a technical sort of sense that you can't uh, interact with them again in the same way multiple times. Um, but like you can also pull a table leg off of the table that's very doable now you can only do that normally uh, on normal tables you can only do that once and you can't put it back very well but the fact that you're considering the table leg to be part of the table is related intrinsically to the fact that you are considering that table with regard to the actions that you might the ways in which you might interact with it and so like there's the right hand and the left hand side of the table because you might choose to put things you know, different things on them, but you don't consider these to be two separate objects because ripping them apart or cutting the table in half and so on would be a lot of work and it's the sort of thing that you can't undo and um, so on. But these are all actions and ways of interacting with it. Um, there, There's no reason to consider the molecules of the table and the molecules of the air above it to be parts of separate objects, given that these things are only in contact with each other, you know, within the table and so on. And you know, there are some particular objects you might be able to consider to be, um, you know, density based, but you actually have air within wood. It's, it's partially hollow, which is why it's so light in point of fact. Um, and, and like the pores that are capable of absorbing water and on and on and on. So the point is, if you think this through, you will find out that the categorization that we use to intellectually understand the world is intrinsically related to our ability to interact with the things. That is, it's inseparable from will. That if you didn't have will, if you didn't have the ability to interact with things, there'd be no reason to use any of the categorization that we do. Um, and, you know, you'll occasionally see science fiction books that, that like go into this, where they take, you know, completely different organisms who have radically different categorizations than we do. I can't think of any off the top of my head, although I, I want to say that may have even come up in, like, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy somewhere. But I can't promise that. It's been, like, 30 years since I read that book. Um, and I don't remember it real well. But I've seen some of these things in science fiction that, you know, that consider... Uh, um, or there's there's one, I think, by Neil Stevenson, where, like, there are ants that... that uh, they only had two categories of like none in a few million and, um, uh, you know, things like that. Um, so you'll see this in science fiction where people play with this. And if you think about some of those, it'll you know help to sort of more imaginatively enter into that. But will, you know, intellect as we have it is inseparable from will. And so if you hold that we do not have free will, you're also holding we do not have an intellect, not in the sense that we actually mean the words. Now, I know that, that, um, if there are any atheists watching, uh, atheists of the correct type, watching this, they will then shout at, at their screens, possibly metaphorically, or type into the comments um, about how, like, no, of course you can. We have these thoughts. We're not questioning whether or not we have these thoughts. We're just questioning whether or not these uh, thoughts are, you know, come about because of free will. And um, that's just utterly missing the point. Like, yeah, obviously we have these thoughts, but the whole problem is that, like, 
that, that shows that we have free will. The, um, you know, also we directly experience it. There, there's a whole funny thing. I, I'm not trying to get into here as to whether determinism is true. I've, I, I've talked about that in other places, but like the short answer is it's obviously true that we have free will. We directly experience it. And when you have somebody who takes like really indirect reasoning, like, oh, something rather yada yada fMRI study, um, or like blah, blah, blah. I've got this faith in, in ph that physics entirely describes the world, even though I know it doesn't because like we don't have a grand unified theory yet. Um, the, uh, like, you know, you'll get those sort of statements of belief and like, these are these weird abstract things so far out of experience, contradicting your direct experience that they're, they're doing literally the kind of thing of like, who are you going to believe me or your lying eyes? And, uh, yeah, we directly ex experience it and all your evidence that our direct experience is wrong is so tenuous at best and ludicrously flawed and incredibly flimsy, frankly. Um, and it's funny that these people hold to this with such tremendous faith in, in this thing that they, they can't even begin to actually do the real work of for most of them. Um, the, uh, you know, and yet, um, they use that to contradict our direct experience. So like, to some degree, you don't really need this in the same way that like, what's my proof that like, I weigh something standing here on earth. Like, I don't, I don't need to prove it to you. Like, it, you know, basically like we're at things like I directly perceive it. It's really, really obvious. Like I hold my arm out and I can feel that it's heavy. I don't need to justify this to you. I don't need to bring out an instrument to show that like, yeah, I weigh something here on planet earth. I just experience it. And like, if you want to contradict that, like, yeah, you're just straight up crazy at this point, like, you know, in the same way that if you look up and you say that, like, the sun comes out at night and there is no moon, like, I, I don't need to prove the sun and the moon to you. You're just a lunatic. So there's no, no actual point in, in doing any of that stuff. Um, the, uh, but like this gets to the real point, to the real heart of it though, that determinism is not really about disbelieving in God. And, and as I said, uh, as I alluded to before, like you see this in Martin Luther, like Martin Luther is a determinist. John Calvin was also, but he is slightly differently. Um, Luther held that, that, deter that um, free will was nonsensical, whereas John Calvin held that free will was destroyed in the, like existed before the fall, but was destroyed in the fall, which is a, a much more intellectually tenable position in, in a certain sense. I mean, it's, it's still obviously wrong experientially, but, um, you know, human beings can choose to do good. I mean, just, you can do it yourself, just choose to do good. That's to say to will the good of the other for their sake. And, um, yeah, you'll find out that's not true directly. I mean, direct observational evidence. Um, but, uh, but having said that, you know, you still have plenty of people who believe very firmly in God, but disbelieved in free will. And the reason I, I'm, I'm really been coming over the years as I've looked at this stuff and looked at, look, how do determinists talk about this stuff and how do they think and what are they trying to do? And to a great degree, what determinists are trying to do is they're trying to get rid of human beings. And it's kind of significant that determinism doesn't get rid of God. It gets rid of human beings that, you know, like, like it, you know, like, yeah, there, there are anthropoid things that make noises that go around. Yeah. Um, but like they become nothing but puppets. They become nothing but, you know, highly animated real dolls. And I've come to believe that this is really the point, although the determinists don't push this very far because of course it'd be completely unworkable to try to even be slightly consistent with it. And they only want some of the effects of it anyway. Um, but that's, you know, with those caveats, I think this is the point of the determinism is to get rid of the other human beings because to, to believe in the existence of other human beings is to make the world too complex. It's easy enough. You, you know, I mean, you, you can believe in God or not believe in God as you please if you're a determinist, but it's really, really easy to turn God into a reflection of yourself in, in your mind. I mean, um, and, and you know, you, you do kind of see this, um, you know, with, with you know, read Luther, read Calvin and, um, late stage Luther, by the way, like on the bondage of the will is like late stage Martin Luther. I don't mean like his writings immediately. Um, like, like, you know, when, when he was an Augustinian monk or, or right, right after he renounced his vows, etc. But, um, you know, his, his thought did develop somewhat over time. And so like read late stage Luther or read like John Calvin and, you know, they, they both kind of, um, 
I understand, like, you know, they're, they're, they're Lutherans and Calvinists and stuff. And, like, you know, no, no shade on you guys. Um, but, but like, read these people. You'll see, like, yeah, God becomes just an extension of them themselves to those people. Like, they, their goal in life is not to, like, you know, submit themselves to the will of God. Um, but, like, other than in the sense that, that you, you see, like, you can... Um, to, to like see your own face in the glossy reflection on the cover of your Bible, in a sense, um, as a metaphor. That that is to say, like you you can seek to do the will of God so long as you're the one defining what the will of God is. This just means doing whatever you want, and uh, that's kind of what you see with them. That's my reading of it. And again, no shade on Lutherans and and Calvinists. They're they're you know lots of good people, um, in, in bad traditions, but um, the uh, you know who who are faithful in trying to follow Christ. So, um, you know, and, and trying to do the will of God. So, uh, again, no shade on them, just on Luther and Calvin themselves. But, um, yeah, that, that's my reading of them. And I, I think we've all seen this kind of thing in other places too, where you have people with very, very selective quotations who are, uh, you know, like your, your classical Bible thumper, that's to say somebody who like is trying to beat people down with it is like that, where, like, you know, in their mind, God is just an extension of their own will. Um, so you see that, but you also see it, you know, without God, you can do that too, because you can still be, you know, can be equally solipsistic with or without God, essentially. Um, but if you believe in other human beings, you can't do this with other human beings. Like, people do occasionally try. This is like the the, um, the devouring mother, for example, that, that archetype. Um, and you see this in some, some you know, other contexts too, you know, like the... Uh, you know, your stereotypical father who's trying to uh, accomplish what he wanted to accomplish through his sons kind of thing. Um, so, so the, you know, like those various things, like you can try to make other human beings extensions of yourself, but it doesn't really work. Um, like, like not in practice, like, the, like it just obviously fails. Um, you know, you can do it for a while, especially like, you know, with really young people, but like then they grow up and it just doesn't work. Um, and try this with other grown people. And for the most part, it just doesn't work. And, um, so if your goal is to be solipsistic, if your goal is to try to fit the entire universe into your head, the thing that you absolutely cannot deal with is other human beings, because it's just too immediately obvious how much you are failing at making them extensions of yourself. And so I think that's really ultimately what the point of determinism is. And, you know, why the determinists are always very, very inconsistent with it. Because they never mean to apply it to themselves, for one thing. Every once in a while, you'll see one of them uh, apply it to themselves as an excuse. But for the most part, they never, ever do. They only apply it to other people. And they only apply it in order to discount having to understand other human beings. Um, like, you know, you just, you, you don't, you know, find somebody somewhere who is both a determinist and also trying to do their best for the human beings around them, who acts consistently out of love, in the sense of agape, the love of God, willing the good of the other for their sake. Um, or, you know, willing the good of the other as other, as Bishop Barron puts it. Find somebody like that. Find a determinist who actually is willing to, you know, wills the good of other people for their sake, who is willing to be um, you know, who, who's even willing to be self-sacrificing, not delayed gratification, but foregone gratification. Like I will be, I will have less pleasure and less happiness for the entirety of my life so that you can have, you know, happiness with a capital H so that you will be better off. And that's a fine trade to me because I've got enough and I want you to have more. Find somebody like that who is a determinist. You won't, you never find those people. And I don't think that's an accident. I don't think it's a mistake. It is, determinism th eliminates, in theory, other human beings. And I really think that determinists don't really miss this fact. They don't, you know, that is to say, they don't, uh, this has not escaped them. This is not something that they're unaware of. They're never consistent with it. You will not ever find a, deter a consistent determinist. But um, I, I think this is essentially the point. So, um, yeah, I, uh, once again, I could have said that, um, in a lot less time if I had, uh, 
far more time to write it down and do lots of editing and so on. So um, I apologize. This is, you know, again, an exercise in, in uh, uh, doing what I can with the, you know, small amount of time that I have available um, and approaching it from several different angles and trying to sort of, uh, I, I also, and I don't know, it, I, I really don't know whether or not I'm better off or not addressing objections in the middle of describing the thing. Um, the goal is to address the, the objection so that it's possible for somebody to have that question answered and then be able to follow along with me rather than to like have a person say like, well, this is a problem and then just stop there and then have to get that addressed in some other way, at which point, you know, they, they'd have to come back. But addressing those objections does, of course, slow down the general flow. And um, so there's that too. And I don't know whether or not I'm actually striking the right balance there. And if I'm striking the wrong balance for you, I apologize. Um, it's an attempt generally to, to be helpful. So for right now, I'm doing the best I can. I I'm not certain that that's I'm um, doing it in the wisest way, but that at least is the reasoning behind the somewhat uh, laborious and somewhat twisting way that I do it. Until next time, may you hit everything you aim at. If you like this video, then clicking the like button, according to YouTube, will make them more likely to recommend it to others. If you know anyone who might get something out of this video, then it would be kind to share it with them or just share it on social media in general. And if you'd like to see future videos of mine, you can subscribe. And uh, if you're not in the habit of checking your subscriptions page regularly, then I suggest clicking the notification bell and setting that to always. Because otherwise, uh, subscribing to a channel basically just sort of like gives YouTube a hint that maybe it should consider recommending these videos to you, possibly at some point, if they think so. It's a funny world we live in. God bless.